Is that screen too close for you to listen? Kind of. But I can only I'll be okay. I guess at some point in the future we can try to branch it out this way, maybe. With your table. You're an extended table. <laughs> Should I have a wing at it? Yeah. All right. We're getting the word that yeah. was ready. So last time when we were together, we made it through verse uh, about five or six in chapter two, and then we used verses five and six to uh, carry us through our work of hours well and looking at it from a sermon aspect. But when we're considering just a refresher as to what we went through last time so that we can go through and uh, try to finish this chapter today, we have Paul illustrating to us what great preaching actually is. That verses 1 through 5 and how that he, coming to the Corinthians, desired not to come with them with uh, wise words, cunning words, or even that which is found in man's wisdom, but that he simply came uh, to cross Christ. And so we have, following this, how it is that true wisdom is going to be known. Now, if Paul's going to make a distinction about heavenly wisdom or divine wisdom set apart from earthly wisdom, okay, how are we going to be able to determine which is which? How are we going to know the difference between the two? There has to be a way in which we're to know the difference. Otherwise, there's no point in making a difference. Why well, point it out? Like, well, this is this and this is that, but then you can't really tell what the difference is. Now, we live in an age where a lot of people will try to mislead and to deceive, and by saying, well, we really are not able to know these things. Well, Paul is going to address that in this section. And we are know, we know what true wisdom is and by the fact that it's been revealed. For Paul to say, we are to know these things, then okay, there has to be some type of revelation about it. So we're going to study this morning the difference between true wisdom and worldly wisdom. And we're going to spend a good bit of time again in Isaiah, because again, Paul is going to make a quotation from Isaiah in this chapter. And again, Paul emphasized the importance of knowing the distinction between these two different types of wisdom so that our faith stands not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And of course, this is going to be essential when it comes to unity. And that's ultimately why we are studying this letter and why we'll study the Second Corinthian letter is because of how to obtain unity how to keep it, how to preserve it, and when unity is lost, when fellowship is lost, how can we regain it? How can we be how can it be brought back? And all these things are being addressed in these in the introduction, in his introduction in dealing with these matters. Well, leave behind fleshly wisdom and follow after the wisdom that's given to you from God. And as we're considering these things, we're also considering, we're learning where it is that divisions come from. Divisions come from people failing to understand what it is that's been revealed to us. Now, in these contexts, Paul is dealing directly with Christ and redemption. And ultimately, that's the problem because those that obey the gospel, that follow after Christ, what do they start, or I guess I should ask, what do they stop doing at some point? You come in following Christ, but then what do you end up stop doing? Now you stop obeying, you stop following the one that actually brought you in. And that, again, is where earthly and fleshly wisdom comes in. Uh, so, and just, you know, so putting this into classification where we can make application for today, when we're considering divisions that come about from people failing to understand how Christ redeems. Well, we're still dealing with that today because we have a large section of our society that looks at religion and looks at salvation and says, well, salvation is by grace. So therefore, that means what in their minds? Alone. All right, grace alone. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. That if it's by grace and it cannot be of works. Well, that's a misunderstanding of how Christ redeems. That's a misunderstanding of grace, and that produces division. Uh, misunderstanding about faith. They think that 
faith is just something that happens inside of your brain mentally. You receive Jesus into your heart. Well, that's not what faith is. Faith can also be translated as trust. If you have trust, then you are going to do something. Trust produces action. Uh, I mean, just I'm sure all of us that are the children here at the table have gone through the period of being in a swimming pool or whatever, and your dad's saying, I'll catch you. <laughs> you know, jump in, I'll catch you, trust me. Well, oftentimes it doesn't go too well. <laughs> but that's the thing. Okay, if you trust me, then jump. All right, if you have faith in me, then act. And the religious world doesn't understand that. So it produces division. So verse 8 and 9. He's already gone through and he's already discussed how it is that he came to them, not in uh, wise words of man's wisdom, standing alone in God's wisdom and the truth of the uh, cross and a crucified Christ. Verse 5 and 6, he says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. So again, we made the point that the word perfect means maturity. I come and speak in these things among them that are mature. Okay, if we're going to start understanding these things, we're going to have to start growing. We're going to have to start maturing. Otherwise, these, you know, these things that we're studying, they're not going to make any sense to us. Verse 7, he says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, we discussed last week how that the word mystery does not just, it doesn't mean something that's mystical or that's impossible to understand. But a mystery is just simply something that is waiting to be revealed. It's a secret that's needing to be shown. And if you want to jot down an, an extra note, we didn't go through this last time, but you can go through it on your, uh, on your own. Go through and read Daniel chapter 2 and the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has and how it is that Daniel comes and tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream and Daniel says very clearly, it's not me that's giving you the interpretation, but it's the God, it is God in heaven that reveals secrets. He reveals mysteries. And that becomes a part of divine revelation. That becomes that heavenly wisdom. Now notice this in verse 8. He mentions this, how that's spoken in a, in a mystery, but then he says in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And actually, let's just go ahead and read through verse, verse 16 so we can get this context down and start breaking apart some even some uh, Calvinistic views that are taken from this, from this section. So verse 8 again, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing, uh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now, those that are the Calvinist viewpoint, and when we say those that are Calvinists, those that follow the teachings of John Calvin, that uh, follow the five points of Calvinism, tulip, total hereditary depravity, born in sin, unconditional election, that is that nobody chooses whether to be saved or be lost, God chooses that, limited atonement, which means that Christ did not in fact die for the entire world, like John 3, 16 says, but that Jesus in fact only died for the elect, limited. Irresistible grace, I, that is that salvation 
again, is something that is brought upon you and that you cannot stand against it. It's irresistible. You just have to obey it. You have no free will in the matter. Uh, I L no see I P uh, perseverance of the saints. Once saved, always saved. Once you're in, you cannot get out. They like to go to this passage because of the reference in verse 14 about the natural man. And that these things, this is in fact describing how it is that we as natural men are receiving this information and that it has to be by, directly from God, it's not within ourselves, because it says right there, the natural man cannot receive, cannot receive, or excuse me, man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Okay, if you're going to receive spiritual things, then you've got to have the Spirit. But what's the problem with that? Well, number one, contextually, we need to take this from the standpoint of what Paul is actually writing to this audience and deal with what those things are. Is Paul talking to natural men? All right, carnal men, and we're going to get there. First off, Paul is not writing this letter to natural men, fleshly men. He's writing this letter to brethren, these that are spiritual men. And even in verse 8, when it says, which none of the princes of this world knew. Now, they would look at that and say, okay, you see right there, it'd be impo it's impossible for them to know. Because they're natural, they're of this world. And Paul says later, natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. But look at what else he says in verse 8. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So right there in that verse, Paul states that there was the possibility for them to know it. Otherwise, why make that statement? Which none of the princes of this world knew. Okay, it's impossible for them to know. But had they known it, they wouldn't have done such and such. Well, in actuality, they would have per the Calvinist view, because they have no choice in the matter. So even if they did know who it was, and they did know the information, they're still going to have to go through and do it, because God is going to make them do it. Now, some some might view that as being a stretch, but that's, and even some Calvinists, they might even try to deny it, but that's the implication of their doctrine. But Paul is, in fact, he's doing away with that very idea by stating that they had the, the ability to know. And even when we're discussing, which none of the princes of the world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And then he quotes verse 9, but as it is written. So when Paul is talking about the princes of this world, who is he talking about? And those that did not know but could have known. The Jews? All right, the Jews. So there again, we are discussing people, I mean, and who are the Jews? They are people that are in covenant relationship with God. They had the scriptures. They had the law of Moses. But they did not know. All right, why did they not know? We'll deal with that a little bit, you know, a little bit later. So we're looking at this from the standpoint of, and this is important for us today because a lot of people, they have a big misunderstanding about how do we gather information? How are we to gather these things that it says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him? Now, when we're considering verse 9, what do people consider verse 9 to be talking about? Well, the Calvinists would say that God didn't change them. Okay. I'm not sure what you're going for. Well, I'm, so. yeah, I'm kind of leaving the Calvinists for now and just thinking just in general. When we start thinking about eye hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered to the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I don't know. I'm thinking about what we've been going through with the chronological study and even mm -hmm. the apostles weren't getting it. Because they're thinking fleshly and carnally, and they're thinking, okay, our king's coming to reign here. And so their eyes are covered because they're not thinking, you know, right deeper. Okay. And then the people don't understand that this is the Christ, and then Jesus is thankful that God has revealed this to the <laughs> apostles somewhat. You know. Well, he actually, Jesus even thanks God that it wasn't revealed unto wise men, but it was actually revealed to babes. Yes. 
That's so interesting. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> you know, and, and the fact that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these learned people, they would not obey what Jesus said, but the scriptures tell us that the common people heard him gladly. Now, these, you know, some of these things are, they're, they are weighty in their subject matter, but it's really not that difficult when you start aligning things with this actual context and other things that are uh, said about it. So verse 9, a lot of individuals, and even some of our own brethren, they look at verse 9 and they would say, well, that's talking about heaven. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have been into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But the problem with that is that we're not discussing heaven in any of this context. What have we been discussing? <clears throat> Understanding God's word. All right. For what purpose? Salvation. Okay, we're talking about salvation. Paul is, in, in fact, discussing with these brethren the scheme of redemption. That has been revealed. The princes of this world, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, as I said, verse 9 is a quotation from Isaiah. So Paul gives comment right here that Isaiah was writing about way back in the Old Testament about how man was going to be redeemed. These are the things that I have not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for them that loved him. It's Isaiah 64, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waited for him. Well, what are we waiting for? The Messiah. In Isaiah's day, we're waiting for the Messiah. <laughs> we are waiting for that seed promise that is supposed to come into the world and give a blessing to all nations. Now, when we're considering what's going on throughout the context of Isaiah, we understand that there is a struggle going on between the physical and the spiritual. That with the children of Israel, they are getting too focused on the ceremonial aspects of their religious system. Okay, we have the tabernacle. Then we have the temple. That's God's dwelling place. Okay, if you've got the temple and that's God's dwelling place, what is that supposed to actually do for you? Is that just a bragging right to the rest of the people? Oh, we've got the temple of God here in our midst. God dwells amongst this group of people. Okay, if God dwells amongst this group of people, then how ought this people to be? What kind of people should they be? Doers. All right, doers, but I just let's go further than that. Righteous. All right, they should be a righteous people. Now, what kind of people were the Jews? Ugly. They were <laughs> very ugly. So right there. Okay, you've got the temple, but you don't understand what the temple actually means. And it's not bringing about any type of application on your life. So what good is the temple? Okay. No good. Absolutely nothing. To the point where Jeremiah has to come on the scene right before the children are going to be, our children of Israel are going to be taken into captivity. And he says to them, you shout, the temple, the temple, the temple. But Jeremiah says, you're going to be taken into captivity and the temple is going to be destroyed. So what do you have then? All you have then is what really you had in the first place, faith. That's all you've got left. And these physical things were designed and given to you so as to implement, to produce, and grow more faith. And it's the same thing like what we have, what we have today. The Lord remember that we have. What's that designed to do? To produce more faith. It's not just a ceremony that we go through and it's like, okay, I did it. It's supposed to bring about application. It reminds us of the great sacrifice that Jesus made. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to make sacrifices. It teaches, it reminds us of his mercy. So how are we supposed to be? Merciful. So to go through the practice of the Lord's Supper without actually implementing those type of things, we've not gained anything. Just going through a ritual. It's the same thing with baptism. Baptism, not properly understanding what the spiritual application is, then yeah, it is just like the denominational world says about us. All you're doing is just getting wet. 
But the fact that you have a physical element attached to spiritual application thus brings it into the spiritual realm and a work of God. But if we're not thinking on what it is that God has said that he would do through baptism, that he would operate and remove our sins, then what is baptism to us? Salvation. Well, in that sense, if we're thinking about those things, it is salvation, but if we're not thinking about those things, it's just, getting it's just getting wet. You might as well just be taking a bath. And so Paul is using Isaiah, as we said, had they known these things, the princes of this world, had they known these, they would not have crucified uh, the Lord of glory. So the, we have contrasted, or we have shown to us throughout the book of it, Isaiah, fleshly thinking contrasted against God's thinking. So here's Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Fairly uh, popular verse. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. So we understand that throughout the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is prophesying about impending doom and that being captivity. <laughs> You're going to be led away. Your children are going to be led away. Your, your wives and your children are going to be sold into slavery. Your men and your young men are going to be destroyed. But when we consider why it is that captivity is coming, why is captivity coming? Sin. Okay, because they've sinned. Now, when we are considering the fact that it says that your sins have separated you, separated between you and your God, your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear, and then we have this picture of physical condemnation. Is that really what they should be worried about, though? I mean, Jesus is going to further illustrate that in Matthew chapter 10 when he warns his apostles and his disciples how they're going to be taken before kings and magistrates and governors and that they're going to be told in that very hour what they need to speak. But then he goes on to give them a word of comfort and he says, don't fear these people, these men that can destroy your body. But who do you, who should you fear? God. Which can do what? Take away the soul. All right. Destroy the body. And the soul. Okay. Destroy both body and soul in hell. So as they are facing physical destruction, it ought to be reminding them that, okay, this physical destruction <laughs> is because of something spiritual that we've done. We have sinned. <clears throat> yes. I know that Calvinists, my Calvinist friend would try to take that and make it be born in sin. Do you know what I mean? So they would try to take it and say, well, this is what separated you from the beginning. Right? So how do you... Well, then this verse makes no sense because why are we, why are we now discussing what has separated you from God when you've always been separated. I mean, this verse is, I mean, this verse is showing a distinction in time that, okay, at some point you were not separated, but now you are. But if Calvinism is true, then they've always been separated. Yeah, I just wanted to know why it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense, yeah. but yeah. Thank you. So as we said, it's all of this is pointing. This, this these are physical elements, but they're all pointing towards a spiritual application. Here's Isaiah 59. We're in verses one and two. Now notice this in verses 15 and 16. So while we're in the midst of discussing about this physical punishment that's coming, what are the people really needing? Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw it that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness is sustained in him. The people should have been realizing we need somebody. Hmm? Which scripture was that? 59, 15, and 16. Yeah, I was looking at it. Was it? Okay. <clears throat> so the people are realizing, or they should be realizing, Okay, we're being punished physically, but we need somebody to stand between us and us and God. Somebody to come in and to plead our case. Now, even going further back from that, here we're in the time of the prophets. Let's go back to the time of the patriarchs. All the way back to the book of Job. 
in Job chapter 9, while he's in the midst of going through a terrible point in his life and then having to deal with, uh, if we can really even call them friends, I mean, with friends like those who need enemies, he makes these statements. And they're true to the ultimate goal of what it is that man is in need of. Job 9, verse 1 and 2, then we're going to drop down to verse 30 um, and read through uh, 35. Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? Now, is that not the ultimate question? How can man, being flesh, and God being spiritual and eternal and all righteous, how can man stand before him just? Now drop down to verse 30. If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch and mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not a man as I am that I should answer him and he and we should come together in judgment. Now notice verse 33. Neither is there any day's man, which can literally be translated as umpire, betwixt us or between us. So even in the time of the patriarchs, what did Job understand that man needed? Mediator. Man needs a go between a mediator, exactly. That without that, notice what else it says, that there's no daysman or umpire that might lay his hand upon us both. And that's exactly what a mediator does. You have two individuals that are in conflict with one another. And the mediator steps in and lays hands on both individuals trying to bring about reconciliation. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak, and not fear him, but it is not so with me. So even in the time of the patriarchs, they understood, okay, we're needing some type of go-between, but we don't have it yet. This was on the minds of people as they were watching these things unfold. But as you get to the time frame of Isaiah... And looking at the time frame of captivity, I mean, you're looking at, oh, let's see, there's 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, and there was 70 years of captivity. So you might be looking at, they're only 500 years away from Jesus being born. And like Jordan was mentioning a moment ago, they're still not getting it. Now, we look at 500 years, and well, that's a big chunk of time, but in the grand scheme of things, not really. And then you can sit, continue on, Isaiah 59, verse 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression, and Jacob said, the Lord. So we were in Job 9. We started out in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, 15, 16. Now we're back in Isaiah 59, verse 20. Isaiah 59 and verse 20 is going to be quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 11. In Romans 11, 25, Paul writes, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. That's the same word that we're looking at here in 1 Corinthians. He said these things, redemption... Christ dying on a cross, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And he says to these brethren, I would not have you ignorant of this mystery. Well, if what people think about a mystery today is true, well, there's no way to understand it. The only thing we can be is ignorant of it. But Paul is saying, no, you can learn about this, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. And like we said, whenever it makes a statement of as it is written or thus said the scripture, it's an Old Testament quotation. There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer. Now Isaiah 59 says the Redeemer. But it's the same thing. 
a redeemer, a deliverer, coming out of Sion, Zion, same thing, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now we're going through all of this just so that we are making it firm and concrete in our minds as to what the ultimate goal of the Bible is. The ultimate goal is as it's stated right here. To take away their sins. And you have Isaiah talking about that. Now going back to Paul's point. We speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. The chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. I mean, Jesus, in a pretty soft way, rebuked Nicodemus when he came asking or didn't really come asking anything. He made a statement and Jesus goes right to the point about how the he's need to be born again and Nicodemus doesn't understand about being born again. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, are you not a teacher in Israel? And you don't know these things? The princes of this world. Now had they knew, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why did they not know it? Studying. They weren't studying it. It's not a thing that they couldn't know. Paul says right here, I wouldn't have you ignorant of it. But they were. And what's the grand mystery? That sins would be taken away. Now notice Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy lights, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. And then you jump over to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. Again, you have this connection with the Gentiles being brought in. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in, in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 is a quotation in Luke chapter 4. When Jesus is in the temple and he asks for the book and he starts reading and he says, this day has this prophecy been fulfilled in your ears. So again, to the point, had they known it, why didn't they know it? They had Jesus right there telling them, these things are happening right before your eyes. So why didn't they know it? Paying attention. Weren't well, paying attention. They didn't want to know it. Because as Jordan was saying a moment ago, it went against their preconceived ideas of what the scriptures were actually teaching. They thought the Redeemer, the Deliverer, was going to be some grand warrior king like David. And that he was going to come back and conquer the earth and bring back Jerusalem into its former Old Testament kingdom glory. But what did they get instead? Meek and yeah, meek and humble, born in a manger, riding in Jerusalem on a colt of an ass. That's not the kind of king that we're thinking about. Did he come to bring about physical relief? Well, yeah, he brought some of that, but ultimately, what was it? Be born again. Be free from your sins. And that right there, the mindset of a Jew, you're coming and telling me, a Jew, that I need to have my sins forgiven? I'm a child of Abraham. What are you talking about? That's the problem. Arrogance. Arrogance self-righteousness. Jesus came to do away with all of that, and they did not enjoy that. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 1 through 3, and then we'll jump down to verse 10. 
For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation therefore thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. One of the biggest problems that the Jews had was that, okay, Gentiles are now being brought into the church. That's a part of the mystery that they should have been ready for. It says right here in Isaiah, who's going to see it? The Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. And what is that going to do to them? Well, in seeing that righteousness, they're not going to stay outside of it. They're going to want to come in. Well, the Jews should have been ready for it. It's talked about in their prophets. Notice verse 10. Go through, go through the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called saw out a city not forsaken. Now again, as you're, and that's part of the difficult thing of dealing with prophecy when these things are being mentioned at the time frame in which they're being mentioned. This does have a physical application. They're going to be brought out of captivity. But in being brought out of captivity, they are designed to be brought out a more spiritual people because of it. Sin sent you into captivity. What's going to bring you out? Righteousness. So all of this, like we're saying, all of this is pointing towards a spiritual application. But they're missing that. They're focused on, okay, we're going to go home. We're going to get our land back. We're going to rebuild our cities. And we're going to rebuild the temple. You're missing it. You had all of those things before you went into captivity. What good are those things going to do you when you come out? Nothing if you don't actually start applying what it is you, that's supposed to be the spiritual application in. Isaiah 64, verse 4 and 5. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God beside thee, what hath prepared for him that waited for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. So in this very context that Paul is quoting, as we said, Isaiah, I mean, excuse me, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 is a quotation of Isaiah 64 and verse 4. What's being discussed in the very context? And right there at the end of verse 5. We shall be saved. So what is it that eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, or has entered into the heart of man for what God has prepared? Salvation. <clears throat> and salvation to the fullest. To where we're not going to have to continuously offer sacrifices year after year. It's just one sacrifice for all and literally for all. Jew and Gentile alike. How is that possible? Well, therein lies the problem. Man likes to rely on on his own senses, the things in which we can know physically. And thus, that was the problem that the Jews had. Well, we can't see it, and we can't hear it, and it's not entered into the heart or the mind of man. Okay, it doesn't make sense to us, so what do we do to it? We reject it. We push it to the side, and we try to manipulate it and bring it back into realms where we can understand it, okay? A physical kingdom, we can see that. We can handle it. We can touch it. We can see the walls going up and everything like that. Don't be wise in your own conceits. But instead, wait for those things. As we said, this is a mystery waiting to be revealed. 
Now, here's the reason we know. And here's the reason why they should have known. Here's the contrast. But, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Now, there is a general way in which that phrase unto us is used, but more specifically, who is that in reference to? Christians. Well, not just Christians. <clears throat> who received it first? Well, not just the Jews. The righteous people. Well, who received it? Who gave it to the Jews? Too far back. You're overthinking it. Acts 2. Holy Spirit. All right. Holy Spirit coming upon who? The apostle. All right. God hath revealed them unto us, the apostle, by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So in this context, Paul is discussing revelation being given to the apostles. Now, Jordan was not all incorrect. No, you were, you were partially right. You just weren't giving the answer that I would give you. Who had this information before the apostles? It's the prophets. So the same way that the apostles are describing how they are receiving this information and giving it out was the same way that it was going on in the Old Testament. No man knoweth the spirit of a man save the spirit of man that's in him. The only way you're going to know what I'm thinking is if I tell you. It's the same thing with God. The only way we're going to know what God is thinking is if he tells us. And Paul says very clearly right here, God has told us. And what he has told us, he has told us about the deep things of God. Now, what are the deep things of God? I'm kind of getting ahead over to our, our sermon time, but we'll hit on it briefly. Don't overthink it, just think about the context. What was the question? What are the deep things of God? You mean it's his word. All right, which leads salvation. To, all right, salvation, redemption. These are the deep things of God. But what do what do people in the world today, when they start thinking about the deep things of God, what do they want to start diving off into? In Revelation, you know, just dealing with the philosophies of God. What is it that makes up God? I don't know, and that's not stuff we're going to be worried about. The deep things that we're going to be worried about are the things that he has shown to us and how it is that man can be saved. That's the deep things of God. And that's what Paul's talking about in the context. So anybody that would try to run away with this passage and try to manipulate it, remember, we're, you know, we're dealing with the deep... Well, it's kind of going back to the Facebook post that you guys were dealing with. And somebody... I uh, can't remember exactly who it was. But they made a comment about... Uh, the connection of Timothy and de dealing with not trivial matters, but questions that gender about strife yeah. and yeah. you know things like that. We're talking about salvation here. Mm -hmm. These are not questions that are to be avoided and that produce strife. These are things that need to be studied out. Paul says these are the deep things of God. But you see, that's fleshly wisdom coming in. Well, I've you know they have missed something somewhere. And so they don't understand it, and so what do they want to do? They want to make it trivial, or make it as though it's much harder than it is to actually be understood. No, it's not hard to be understood. If God revealed it to us, then he wants us to know it, and he's going to put it in a form in which we can know it. And to say that there is no way that we can actually know it is to bring a condemnation on God that he messed up somewhere. And giving it to us because we can't understand. Paul's dealing with all of that here. It's been revealed unto us and it's been get revealed to us unto, uh, by his spirit. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, 
but the Spirit which of, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And that is in connection still with these deep things. Which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So how are they getting this information? It comes from God through the Spirit, being given to men, and then what do men do? Which things also we speak. It's not difficult. And it's not something mystical. Now, people want to try to make it that way just because of how simple it actually is. I mean, you take, for example, the just the whole idea of the Pentecostal movement and speaking in tongues. There's nothing difficult about that. They want to try to make it difficult because they know how simple it is and that what they're actually doing is sinful. But, much like the Jews, they have power and position from it, and they do not want to lose their power and position for what the truth is. They have great wealth that they achieve from it. And so what do they do with the truth of the matter? They just toss it aside, because it doesn't benefit us. Oh, it does. Just not in the physical realm. We're not going to get rich off of preaching the gospel to people. Jesus didn't. The apostles didn't. And our brethren in the first century were not getting rich off of what they were doing. But you find stuff, you find information inside of the Bible that people want. And you manipulate it and misuse it. And you pervert it. There's a market for that. And, I mean, it's just, it is a sad thing how much people are willing to pay for false religion. They will pay out the nose for it. And why? Because they have this idea, well, if this is God we're dealing with, and it should be, you know, it should be a lot harder than this. Why? If what we're talking about is trying to get to heaven, why would God want to try to make that hard? I mean, it's already hard enough because we're flesh and having to control the body. That's hard enough. So then God's going to make it 10 times more difficult by, okay, I've laid out a path, but unless you're Nicolas Cage in National Treasure, you're not going to be able to find it. <laughs> it's not how it operates. It's simple. It's laid out plain for those that actually want to know it. Verse 14 but the natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, we're going to try to move through this a little bit, uh, kind of quickly, because we're at 47 minutes right now. But what is the natural man here? All right, we know that's going to be the carnal man from what we're going to get into in chapter 3. But let's just consider, and again, that, that answer is not all the way wrong. It's just not what I'm looking for. Without God. Okay, that which is going to be without God. And let's just consider, let's go back to the beginning. Let's think about the original man, the original couple. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we have it being said about God creating Adam. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now, there's your natural man. The natural man is just a shell. He's made of the dust of the, dust of the ground. He's just laying there. But notice what then happens. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. There's the spiritual man. So we are, in a way, two people. There's the me that you see, but is that really me? No, what's really me is what is breathed into me. 
my soul, which makes up my personality and makes me who I am. And we further realize that from the concept of, I mean, when I die, you're not putting me in the ground. You're putting the natural man, you're putting that shell in the ground. I'm going to go on. And you have that being further illustrated in the second Corinthian letter, second Corinthians chapter four and verse 16. Paul writes, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, the natural man, though he perish, what? Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now, if you take Adam and Eve and they're placed in the garden, okay, that's physical man, physical woman in a physical world. But when God revealed his mind to them, when God revealed to them every tree of the garden you can freely eat, but this one tree you cannot eat of, and the day you eat thereof, you will die. What's difficult about that? No. And that's God revealing himself. How did he do it? By speaking to them. Well, speaking how? By speaking words that they're going to understand. It's, it's not God jumping through some hoops, you know, going, going over the natural way in which we learn things. He's using that. He's made us that way. So when God then reveals his mind to them, that then is communion with the spiritual part of man. God revealing himself and making in spiritual application for them. You're in the physical, but you're also in the spiritual. And here's what you're needing to make sure that you understand. Now, when we're considering, just thinking even further, I mean, let's go back to verse 11, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. If God had not, had, had not told Adam and Eve, do not eat of this tree. Then they're at liberty. Or they could have eaten of every tree or none at all. But the fact that God revealed himself to them and told them these things, they now know what God knows. So when Eve saw the fruit that it was able to make one wise, it was pleasant to the eyes, it was good for food, and it was able to make one wise. That is guidance of the physical. And that's the material side. Because here's what God has already said. Do not eat of the tree. But what does the natural man try to do? The natural man tries to find excuses as to why it would be okay to do something. And then you throw on top of that the temptation of of the serpent, of him actually coming in and casting doubt on what God said. God clearly said, if you eat, you're going to die. But the serpent came in and said, no, God knows that when you eat of the tree, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. I mean, that's a, I mean, that's just a flat out lie from what God had already said, but that's Ultimately, what the flesh tries to do, the flesh tries to find some way to undermine and second-guess what God has said. And I mean, we can see that even as we move, like let's move from the spiritual aspect of God's law and we move it into the physical realm, which ultimately still is the spiritual realm because of the rules that our parents are going to give us are still God's rules. Kids growing up and they hear their parents saying, you know, don't do this and don't do that. Well, how do we make excuses for that? growing up and going ahead and doing something that our parents said that we shouldn't do. It's just the same thing the devil did. Well, they're just trying to hold something back from us. They're just not wanting us to have any fun. Mm -hmm. So on and so forth. All these ways to try to find loopholes and to excuse ourselves to go ahead and do those things that we know that we shouldn't do. That's being guided by the natural man and not by the spiritual man. And so that's that ultimately is the background of the natural man that 
Paul's discussing here. He doesn't go anywhere. Now we're supposed to rein him in and bring him under subjection. But while I am a Christian, I'm still a natural man. I still have this body. And so guess what? This body has desires. This body has wants. But I cannot be led, guided by that natural side. I'm supposed to be guided by the spiritual side and understanding that, okay, I do not give into these things because there's a reason for it. It's for my benefit. God's not just trying to put a whole bunch of rules on me to make me unhappy. He gives us commandments. I mean, we have laws for our protection, for our safety. And it's only when we start viewing them that way that we'll really start appreciating them. So it's not this idea, verse 14, the natural man, it's not this idea that we're born with a depraved, sinful nature. That's not what Paul's discussing. Excuse me, not what he's discussing. He's discussing the fact that we're both physical and spiritual. Why do the Jews not understand? They're being led by the natural man, not the spiritual man. Had they been led by the spiritual man, they would have understood. Just like so many, when Jesus was alive, they understood. Uh, again, Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul is going to use the same illustration. Let no man beguile you of your reward and involuntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And it's not a situation that we have two minds. We only have one mind. But it's what our mind is going to be dominated by. Is our mind going to be dominated by fleshly things or by spiritual things? And we won't take the time to go through it this morning, but uh, if you, when you have some time, go through James chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. And again, you can see this all being illustrated. The difference between the wisdom that is of this earth and the wisdom that is from above. Note, we will deal with verse 15 and 16. Notice this. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it is earthly. The same idea. Fleshly. Natural. It's sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So here we have James in the same context of 1 Corinthians. With all the division that's going on in that church. Why is it? Because they're not following the wisdom that's from above. But it's the wisdom that's from beneath. What God has shown. But the wisdom that's from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That is divine revelation. And it produces these things. If we're following the wisdom that's from above, then what? There should be purity. There should be peace, gentle with one another, easy to be entreated. And with what we've just gone through in the past couple of weeks, we can see very clearly what the brethren down the road are being guided by. There was nothing peaceable, nothing gentle, not easy to be entreated with that group. Full of mercy, there was not one bit of mercy. Okay, that's not divine wisdom. That's them being led and guided by the natural man, the fleshly side. And what does it produce? The very things that James is talking about here. Envy and strife, confusion, every evil work. Jude one nineteen, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit, the natural man, living by the impulse and the dominion of the flesh, walking by sight and not by faith. Um... So yeah, we'll we'll hold off on that. Or we'll we'll stop there with the idea about who it is that's causing the confusion. Well, no, we'll we're we'll going to finish it because it's it's easy. Who's causing the confusion? Devil. All right, devil ultimately. But when Paul references here in verse fourteen, the natural man receives not the things of the spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. Well, Paul has already labeled these individuals. Back in the first chapter. Chapter 1, 22 and 23, the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. 
Now, it's both Jew and Gentile causing division. But why is it? Because the physical man looks at these things and says, this is foolishness. But it's done that way, as we've already said, so that God gets the glory. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither sent into the heart or the mind of man the things which God prepared for them. All right, if I can't comprehend it through the five senses, it doesn't make any sense to me. And that's what these individuals are leaning on. And individuals today who still struggle with that same idea, they end up going to the further extreme by then saying, well, if we, if it's not something that's eye has seen, ear heard, and so on and so forth, then it's got to be something that's just overly spiritualized. Well, no, we can't go that route either. We can only go by what has been revealed. And once we start trying to go past that, we start getting in trouble. I mean, you take, for example, when Jesus is crucified and the uh, veil of the temple is rent from the top to the bottom and you have those people that were raised from the dead and it says the ghosts went into Jerusalem. Well, what happened to those people? Good question. No, it's not. Did they? I don't know. It's not revealed to us. So guess what? I don't need to start trying to guess as to what ended up happening with those people. Whether they were taken up or whether they were taken back into Hades or they, I don't, I don't think it, it wasn't a thing that they were brought back into their physical bodies like Lazarus. It says that their ghosts went into Jerusalem. Well, what happened to them after they went to Jerusalem? It doesn't tell me. So I don't need to worry about it. I just know that it happened. And kind of just individuals, when you start trying to get, you know, into off into that type of stuff, and then people start looking at things that are clearly revealed to us, and then they start muddying the water. Just take what is said for what it says, as it's been revealed. And the things that we don't have, just leave it alone. And leave, you know, leave speculation and leave trying to put it into the framework of our, you know, five, five senses. Don't do that. As it speaks, let it speak. Where it's silent, let it be silent. And let's just be satisfied with what God has revealed to us. So verse 15, he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So here is a powerful point. In making sure that we're following after the spiritual things of life. He that is spiritual judges all things. That is an honorable position. Or at least it should be. I know that our court system is highly perverted and corrupt. But it used to be a judge was an honorable place. It was an honorable position to hold. Well, when we're considering in the spiritual realm and within the Lord's body that those that are spiritual and they judge all things, that is a high place to be. And then even further, he says, yet he himself is judged of no man. The reason why that is, is because if you are a spiritual person, then what about any accusation that a person might make against you? It won't stick. It won't be true. It's much like what we were, uh, we were in the book of Job earlier. Job could not be judged by any of his friends. Um, the book of Job starts out very clearly by saying that Job was an upright man, which that in the Hebrew is translated as being righteously perfect, righteously whole and complete. So who are Job's friends to come to him and start trying to judge him? That's the benefit of being a spiritual person. You judge all and you yourself are judged of no man because of what it is that you're actually following. Verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Now that's a great question. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? The Spirit of God reveals the mind of God. 
Now, ultimately, the question that Paul is asking is from the standpoint of fleshly wisdom and spiritual wisdom. Okay, who's known, who in this context, Jew or Greek, has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Okay, God, here's how you need to do it. Or, God, if I were in your position, here's how I would do it. Well, nobody's in that position. But, he says, but we have the mind of Christ. If God had never unveiled his mind, we would not know anything. And so as we're discussing this idea of salvation, if God had not shown to us and given to us the way of salvation, we would have never known it. But yet we have a whole host of people that will try to take what God has simply said about salvation and try to put their own spin on it. Well, here's what we say about salvation, or here's how we think salvation ought to go. Just do what it says, and everything will be just fine. Now, again, Paul's going to uh, restate this in the book of Romans. Romans 11, verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been, in his, or been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things, and to whom be glory forever. Amen. So we're at the close of chapter 2 in the same way in which we close chapter 1. Chapter 1 closed by Paul saying, But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, what about when it comes to salvation, redemption, and these deep things of God? Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Nobody. So who gets the glory? God gets the glory. But he does go on and say, but we have the mind of Christ. Which is to say, Okay, we do not know the mind of the Lord that we can instruct him, but do we know something? Oh, we know something. We have the mind of Christ. And that's going to uh, help as Paul moves further, uh, especially into chapter 3 and later on, uh, chapter 11, when he gives encouragement to the brethren that they are to follow him, be followers of Paul, as he's a follower of Christ. Well, how are we going to do that? We have to take on this mind. So again, not being led by the physical, not being led by the natural man, but being led by the spiritual man. That we're being led by Christ. And in doing these things, it's going to alleviate the contentions, the strifes, the schisms, as we said, Paul, in this section, he's addressing the problems. He's giving the solutions. How do we remove these divisions about these teachers? We're following Christ. And start dividing up and saying, well, I'm following this man, and you're following this man. That's not following the spiritual mind. That's natural. And that leads to confusion, and as Jamie put it, every evil work. So any closing thoughts, comments, questions on chapter 2? So those two exist? <laughs> well, <laughs> it depends on how you look at the word ghost. In Old English, ghost just meant guest. And to properly translate it would be that their spirits went into Jerusalem. So, yeah, I mean, it would be possible for a spirit to return. You have that in First Samuel where Samuel appeared to Saul. Okay, that was his spirit or his ghost coming back from the Hadean realm. Um, what's another? The only ones I can think of are actually physical. Oh, yeah, there it was. Matthew 17 of Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. That wasn't their physical body. It's whatever the spiritual body is. So, yeah, it's, it's not like the movies where... <laughs> Houses is being haunted, but 
there is a spirit or a guest that lives inside of us, that lives inside of the shell. And that's what goes on. So those spirits didn't go and take care of the olifants. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If nothing else, then we'll... Just a little bit of a vision.